reading from Psalm 90, verses 1 through 17. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we have been dismayed. You have been... You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence, for all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain seventy years, or if due to strength, eighty years, yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone, and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? So teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom, do return, O Lord, how long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. O satisf satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. As we get into the, the message this morning, I want to remind you just what a, a busy time we're currently in. Summer is always like that around the Broken Arrow Church, and uh, the next couple of weeks are no exception. Tomorrow begins the seventh week of New Heights Summer Camp, the seventh of eight weeks of New Heights Summer Camp, just two more weeks remaining. And uh, we look forward to sharing more with you about what's gone on this summer, but it has been an incredible summer thus far with New Heights. Uh, Talking is Teaching is this Thursday from 6 to 7 in the Outreach Center. Next Sunday, the 29th, Kevin told us about the special contribution that we're going to have for Burnt Cabin. It's also a fifth Sunday, so we're going to have a fellowship meal in the Outreach Center following uh, the, the morning assembly. And then two weeks from today on August the 5th, uh, Vacation Bible School begins, and you'll be hearing more about that in, in the days ahead. And thanks for all of the preparation and planning and work that, that's going into that. As I've reviewed those things, you may have noticed that I spoke rather confidently that those things were going to happen. And I don't know if they're going to happen or not. Uh, it depends. It depends on what God decides to do. It depends on whether Jesus comes back or not. Uh, but we often speak in very, very certain terms. We use the language of absolutes, the language of certainty when we talk about what will happen in this place. Uh, notice when I go through things like that, I, I just say that this is going to happen and this is when it's going to happen. And it's just part of our normal, everyday conversation. This afternoon, I'm going to... Tomorrow, I've got to, on Friday, I'll be whatever. And we just fill in those blanks week to week. We're quite in the comfortable habit of saying, when I get up in the morning, rather than, if I get up in the morning, then these are the things I'm going to do. And yet, Scripture repeatedly warns us that life is way too brief Life is way too uncertain to make those kinds of pronouncements and proclamations without qualification. Proverbs 27, 1, don't boast about tomorrow for you don't know what a day may bring forth. We've got no idea what tomorrow's going to be like. We've had enough yesterdays that we may have some idea of how things may play out, but as far as what is absolutely going to happen... We just don't know. 
Normally, I, I reserve Eugene Peterson's The Message to follow in behind a text that we've already looked at, at a more, in, from a more standard English translation. But this text from James 4 is so familiar to us, built on this passage in Proverbs 27, 1, that I just want us to look at the message to start with. Verses 13 through 15, James 4, And now I have a word for you who brashly announced today... At the latest, tomorrow, we're off to such and such a city for a year. We're going to start a business and make a lot of money. You don't know the first thing about tomorrow. You're nothing but a wisp of fog, catching a brief bit of sun before disappearing. Instead, make it a habit to say, if the master wills it, and if we're still alive, we'll do this or that. I started to get up this morning and say something like, uh, welcome to all of you fellow wisps of fog. And without this context, uh, you might have thought I'd gone a bit around the bend, but we are wisps of fog. This life is a mist, it's a vapor, it's a cloud. Um, enjoying our, our time this summer with the high school class in the book of Psalms from Psalm 39 verses four through six, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those uh, who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. And, and that passage began uh, in verse 4 with the words, Show me, Lord, the end of my life. Show me, let me know, teach me, remind me, help me understand, help me wrap my brain around just how fleeting my life is. And how fleeting is it? Well, multiple scripture tells us that life is a blur. That's what Job said. Job 7, verses 6 through 9, he said, my, my life is faster, swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Please don't YouTube anything right now at this moment, but at a later moment, YouTube uh, flying shuttle. Weaving and flying shuttle. And if you've seen weaving done with a flying shuttle, that thing rockets across the loom like a rocket. And Job says, that's my life. It's gone. I don't know how, Job, uh, how old Job was when he said that, when it was ultimately written down. He was old enough to have 10 adult children who were out on their own. So he's seen a few years. He's seen a few decades of, of life. And he says, it's a blur when I look back over my life. In that same context, verses 6 through 9 of, of Job 7, remember that my life is as a breath, as the cloud fades and vanishes. His life had flown by. Going back to, to Psalm 39, surely all mankind is a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Both Psalm 39 and Job describe life as a breath, a single breath. So we're going to do a quick deep breathing exercise. I'm going to ask you in just a second to take a deep breath with me and hold it for just a second, okay? So inhale, birth, adolescence, young adulthood, hold it just a second. And then exhale, middle age, golden years, death. That's life. That was it, in a breath. And because we've got 70 or 80 or 90 or maybe 100 years, it seems like that sometimes. It, it seems a lot longer. But in the eternal context of things, it is just a breath. A hand breadth is what it, it's called also there in Psalm 139. But the, the, the hand has been used to measure things for a long, long time. I don't know if any of you are night sky aficionados and either amateur or professional astronomers, but you know, if you're reading about positions of stars and constellations and you've got degrees, if you, if you hold a fist at arm's length against the, the sky, 
It works in the day, but we don't have reference points during the day. But if you do that with the night sky, that's about 10 degrees ac across your, your fist. Uh, that's 15, excuse me, that's 25 degrees. Um, that, let's see, that's, that's about eight, maybe. The, but the, the hand measuring horses across the breadth of the hand is uh, calculated to be four inches. Okay, so measuring a horse from ground, uh, from the bottom of the hoof up to the, to the withers, uh, we, we calculate the height of those horses in, in hands in, in four inch increments. And the psalmist in Psalm 39 says, my life is four inches long. It's just the breadth of a hand. That's the span of it. That's the, th those are the parameters. Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8. A voice says, cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. All its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And that's quoted by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, although the song that's based on that in one of the hymnals says it's verses 23 and 24. Don't know how they came up with that. This song isn't in our current hymnal, but many of you know it from hymnals that you used in, in years past. And it's based on all those texts, cumulatively, that we've already considered. The first verse says, as the life of a flower, as a breath or a sigh. So the years that we live as a dream hasten by. True, today we are here, but tomorrow may see just a grave in the veil and a memory of me. And the chorus, as the life of a flower, as a breath or a sigh, so the years glide away and alas, we must die. The text that Nathan read for us from Psalm 90, uh, just looking at some selected verses here, 3, 10, and 12. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. And you recall what God says to Adam after the fall as he describes the consequences that will be suffered by the woman for her sin and the man for his sin. He says, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust." Into dust you shall return. Dust in the wind, as Kansas put it so melodically uh, several years ago. Verses 10 and, and 12, the years of our life are 70, or if by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble, for they are soon gone and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. This psalm is attributed to Moses. And the book of Psalms itself dates back about 3,000 years. Um, if this psalm was written by Moses, then that puts this psalm at about 4,400 years old. And Moses, even though he lives to be 120, says the parameters of our life are 70 or, or 80 years. And 4,400 years later, with all of our medical science and all of our advanced diagnostics and technology and treatments and cures, the average lifespan in the U.S. is still 78.74 years. With all of that, 4,400 years later, ladies, average of 81.2 years, men, an average of 76.4. With all of our medicine, with all of our science, with all of our pharmaceuticals, we've still got about the same span of life. So I, I tried to take that to heart when the psalm says, psalmist says, Lord, teach me to number my days. So I took 76.4 years, multiplied that by 365, and figured out if I live the average age of a man in this country, I will live 27,886 days. Then I calculated the days I've already lived. And that came to 20,340, which leaves me a balance of, and this is as of today, I have a balance of 7,546 years. Of course, as you know, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But if I live 76.4 years, that's what I've got left in the bank. 
Um, that comes out to about 20 years, but when you look at it as a number of days, it just doesn't look like very much. Uh, it looks like I'm way down the back side of that hill. 73% of it gone, 27% remaining. If you like pie charts, this is what it looks like. If you like pie, this is what it looks like. <laughs> That's what I've got left. And I hope I get every bite. I hope I get to lick the plate, you know, but on that last day of, of the pie. I hope I just get to lick it clean. But that doesn't look like a lot of pie left. Memento Mori is a medieval practice uh, started in the Middle Ages, still continues in many contexts, but it was a, a practice, thought process, reflection on mortality, especially as a means of considering the vanity of earthly life and the transient nature of all earthly goods and pursuits. Uh, memento is from the Latin verb that means to remember, to bear in mind, and so we get our word, memento, in memory and remember from that Latin root. Uh, mori is from the verb meaning to die, and so we get mortal and mortality and mortician and morbid from, from that root. But memento mori was a conscious effort to try to be reminded on a regular basis of how brief life is and how certain death is. This also had a background in Roman philosophy and thought. Seneca the Younger, in his work entitled On the Brevity of Life, wrote, let us prepare our minds as if we'd come to the very end of life. Let us postpone nothing. Let us balance life's books each day. The one who puts the finishing touches on their life each day is never short of time. The Christian, uh, early Christian writer, Latin writer from North Africa, uh, Tertullian, wrote that it was the practice of the, the Roman emperors and generals as they went in triumphal procession after a great victory that as they were received by the throngs and the crowds who were cheering and yelling their name and speaking to them as if they were gods, uh, they would have a servant, they would have an aide walking right behind them, whispering in, the ear, in, in their ear, remember, you must die. Remember, you are mortal. It hasn't been confirmed in a lot of Roman historical, secular Roman historical uh, sources, but Tert Tertullian says that, that that was a practice. Memento mori means remember death, remember you must die. And so in the Middle Ages, Memento Mori began to, to find its way in, in artwork. You've, if you've ever wondered, why do all these old pictures have skulls in them? It's because it was an example of either vanitas, which is out of Ecclesiastes, vanity, 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 all is, is vanity. Uh, but again, a reminder of the certainty of death and the brevity of life. This was painted in uh, somewhere between 1626 and 1628 by Franz Halls, uh, entitled Young Man with a Skull. Uh, Philip de Champagne's uh, Vanitas from 1671 reduced life to these, these three essentials. There's life represented by the tulip, there is death represented by the skull, and there is time. And time is on the move. Uh, this affected puritanical thought and those who first settled this country. This is a self-portrait by Thomas Smith, a 17th century Puritan, and even in painting his own image, he wanted to remind himself that he was sort of painting on borrowed time and his life was not going to be forever. Uh, the first of two rings that I wear on my right ring finger is my father's wedding band. And just within the last two weeks, I've had two different people in two different contexts ask me about this, this ring on my right ring finger. And this ring means a lot to me, but it also serves for me as memento mori. Um, it reminds me that, that this is a ring that my father wore for 58 years. He wore it for 52 years, uh, married to my mom and then he wore it for six years following her death until his own death. And since then, 
Uh, it's, it's been on my right ring finger. I've worn this other one on this finger for 30 years, but one day both of these rings will belong to somebody else. They'll be on somebody else's finger, they'll be on a chain, they'll probably be in a box somewhere. And because this was his, and because he is gone, it reminds me that's where I'm going to. Not meaning to be morbid or depressing, it's just sobering and grounding, and it keeps me oriented and keeps me focused on priorities. And so use things as reminders. Use those things that the psalmist used in Psalm 39 that Job talked about in Job 7. The breath, the sighs, the mist, the, the fog. Uh, it would have been nice this morning to walk out on a cabin deck and see something like that. But when you see something like that, just don't ooh and ah and say, I wish I could stay here forever. Remember that later in the day, not much later in the day, that's not going to be there. It's going to be gone. And when you see a, a beautiful pond like this early in the morning, enjoy the beauty, enjoy the serenity and, and the peace, but let that remind you that like that mist is going to be gone as the sun begins to rise, so my life is going to be gone. And when you hear someone sigh, life will make you sigh. And when you hear someone just go, Let it remind you. When you take one of those deep cleansing breaths and you just let it go and then it fades and then you feel that urge to inhale again, let that remind you of the parameters of your life. The New England Primer was first published uh, between 1687 and 1690 in the colonies. Uh, it continued in use on up into, there, there were other primers that were printed, but in rural areas, Appalachia and other places continued to be used in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. And in teaching the alphabet to these children, uh, it's wonderful how so much is built around biblical truth. Uh, in each panel, there's a, a featured letter of the alphabet. Uh, that letter is, is capitalized, but as I looked through this, I was reminded how much of this was to even teach children about their mortality. So in Adam's fall, we send all uh, thy life to mend, this book attend. The cat doth play after she slay. Um, a dog will bite a thief at night. An eagle uh, in flight, an eagle's flight is out of sight. The idle fool is whipped at school, used to be. Um, as runs the glass, and, and here's the first of these, as runs the glass, man's life doth pass. My book and heart shall never part. Uh, and for some, I guess there's no I in alphabet, in the word alphabet, because they, they skip the letter I here. Job feels the rod and blesses God. Proud chorus troops were swallowed up. The lion bold, the lamb doth hold. The moon shines bright in time of night. Nightingales sing in time of spring, the sturdy oak, it was the tree that saved his royal majesty. Uh, Peter denies his lord and cries. Queen Esther comes in royal state to save the Jews from dismal fate. Rachel doth mourn for her firstborn. Samuel anoints whom God appoints. Then this one, time cuts down all, both great and small. And then it goes PG-13 really quickly. Uriah's lovely wife made David seek his life. This panel just doesn't seem to fit with the others with Bathsheba bathing and the, the king leering from the roof. Uh, whales in the sea, God's voice obeys. Xerxes the Great, it's challenging to use the letter X. Xerxes the Great did die, and so must you and I. Youth's forward slips, death soonest nips. Zacchaeus did climb the tree, his lord to see. Even in teaching the, the alphabet to children and the rudiments of spelling to children, there were reminders to them that you may be young now uh, and you may be forever young. You may not live to adulthood. Life is uncertain. And so it's not surprising that on page 21 is the prayer that my mother prayed with me beside my, my bedside uh, for years when I was, when I was a child. 
A uh, little different version of the one you see here. Uh, but now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, or I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord, or I pray the Lord, my soul to take. And I don't know how much of a practice that still is. Kind of strikes us as a rather morbid bedtime prayer. Remember when this was written in the late, teen, late 1600s. Think of what infant mortality was in those days. Think how few people, the percentage of people, that lived to adulthood. And for some reason they, they thought it important early on to remind their children, teach their children that life is short and death is, is certain. It's amazing how things get impressed in your consciousness and, and mentality. I, there was a really stressful, well, there were a lot of stressful times when I was in college, but one particular time at the end of a semester when I had punted preparation for exams and a couple of papers till the very last minute, minute I had uh, gone through some consecutive all-nighters and finally got everything turned in, got you know, the, the tests completed, made it back to the dorm room. This must have been junior or senior year because uh, Charlie and I were rooming together and I had the top bunk. And it was sort of the middle of the afternoon. Charlie was gone. I crawled up in the bed to grab a few hours sleep and I wanted to say something to God before I signed off and went into a coma. And it just came out of my mouth. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That was all I had. That was the best I could do in that moment. But I hope that the meaning of that prayer has, has stayed with me in the years that have followed. And we don't often allow our minds to linger there or to linger there for very long, but we should. We should take time in the hustle and the bustle and the busyness and the plans and our absolute language and our words of certainty about what's going to happen when to remind ourselves uh, that it's not forever going to be that way. Uh, Mark Knopfler's last studio album came out in 2015 entitled Tracker and there is a track on the Tracker album about Basil Bunting. Uh, Bunting lived from 1900 to 1985, he was uh, an English poet, grew up in Northumberland, in Newcastle upon Tyne. He became very celebrated in the U.S. after World War II, but he was largely overlooked at home and just couldn't make a living writing. And so he was working as a sub-editor for the Chronicle uh, in New Newcastle, uh, just editing copy. And Knopfler, amazingly, as a teenager, had a Saturday job at the Chronicle as a copy boy. And he remembered how out of place this man looked. He was much older than everybody else. His, his clothes were out of style. He looked unhappy all the time because he didn't want to be there. Uh, one of the lines in the song is, poets have to eat as well. Uh, so in order to eat, he just took this job so he could have some money, so that he could make a living. But, but the song describes, and, and Bunting would become celebrated again. He, um, Brig Flats was a, a poem that he released in 1966, kind of put him back on the, on the map. He left the, the newspaper. But the song sort of longingly describes what he would rather be doing. And there, there are a couple of lines uh, that say, what he wouldn't give just to walk out today to have time to think about time to just leave that behind, walk away, and have the luxury of time to think about time, to think about life, to think about death, to think about eternity, to think about those things that oftentimes we don't let our minds dwell on. That's where sil silence and, and solitude play a role. We need to take time to think about time. I had time to think about time when I had a high school job as a groundskeeper in a cemetery in Lewisburg, Tennessee. This is the only picture online I could find of it. It's not a great picture. I wish the power lines weren't there, but it's, it's a, a vast city cemetery in Lewisburg, Tennessee. 
and myself and six friends from high school worked for the city as, as groundskeepers. We started working uh, after school before Easter to kind of get ready for, for Easter. And then after school was out for the summer, we worked five days a week, eight hours a day, 40, 40 hours a week, we worked there. It took us six days, six work days to cover the cemetery. We would start on a Monday, we would get to the other end the following Monday and then start at the other end the, the following Tuesday. But mowing and weed eating around tombstones all day uh, gives you time to think about time. And when you see the, the dates of birth, when you see the dates of death, and when you see sometimes that that was the same day, or when you see it was only four years later, or five years later, or 15 years later, or 25 years later, sometimes 80 years later, but there was no rhyme or, or reason. It was all over the map. And I didn't know on those hot summer days when I was working there that a couple of years later, a high school friend would be buried there. Before my junior year, uh, we moved to Montgomery, Alabama. And I went my senior, uh, junior year and senior year of high school there, and one of the things I was looking forward to after graduation was going back up to Lewisburg to visit old high school friends. We had all graduated now. The one person that wasn't there when I got back was a friend named Karen. She sat near me or behind me in French class and geometry and, and other classes uh, in the 10th grade before I moved. Like three days after graduation, uh, Karen and another friend of mine were out in a Jeep. Uh, at least he had been drinking. I don't know if she had or not, but unfortunately he had. Uh, they took a corner far too, too fast. Neither were wearing seat belts. Both were thrown from the vehicle. He survived. She did not. And within a week or so after graduation, Karen was buried in the cemetery. And that was one of the places I went when I went back. And it's the first time as a teenager that I just remember crying my eyes out uh, because I found out where her grave was in Lone Oak Cemetery. And I went there and I stood there and I lamented and I cried and I regretted things that I didn't say, including things about my faith, including things that I don't know if she knew or not, but I hadn't made any difference as far as that was concerned. And it was a reminder to me that we're not guaranteed anything after graduation. We're not guaranteed graduation. One more musical reference before we, we wrap up. Um, Late for the Sky was released in 1974. Uh, Jackson Brown, it was his third or fourth studio album. How many of you guys are 14? Anybody exactly 14 years old? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, Olivia's 14. That album was released 30 years before you were born. I am very, very old. I am so very old. 1974 was when that album came out. But there's a song entitled uh, on that album, entitled For a Dancer. And again, I don't know how old Job was when he was writing about the brevity of life, but I know that Jackson Brown was 26 years old when he wrote this song. And for some reason, he was thinking about death. And he must have lost somebody that he, that he loved. Because he writes, I don't know what happens when people die. Can't seem to grasp it as hard as I try. It's like a song playing right in my ear that I can't sing, but I can't help listening. I can't feel, help feeling stupid standing around crying as they ease you down. Because I know that you'd rather we were dancing, dancing our sorrow away, no matter what fate chooses to play. Just do the steps that you've been shown by everyone you've ever known until the dance becomes your very own. No matter how close to yours another steps have grown, in the end there is one dance you'll do alone. And he was talking about death. I loved the way David wrapped up his victory part, his finish part last Sunday morning with his friend David Smith running beside him and then him crossing the finish line. And if you recall the text on that PowerPoint slide, it said slide, side by side until the end and then the reward. And we've got other people in this race with us 
that can be with us up till that point that we live this world, leave this world for the next. Uh, but at that point, that's a line we finish by ourselves. There's one dance we'll do alone. But the beauty is that it's not really alone. Because we're just transitioning from this side of eternity with God's presence and spirit residing in us and being welcomed into God's presence on the other side. And while that is something that we will go through individually, it's truly not something that, that we do alone. Take time to think about time. Take time to think about life and death and mortality and what matters most and what you really need to get done today, just in case this is the last one. And there's nothing more important than getting your life right with God if you haven't done that already. So if you believe that Jesus is God's son, say so. Confess him. Turn from sin. Be united with Christ in baptism as Chris was last Tuesday. I, I, I tell you, Chris would tell you right now he's never had a feeling that, like that in his life. Knowing that his sins were washed away, knowing that guilt was gone, knowing that he had eternity in his heart. Whatever needs you might have, take advantage of this day by making that known as we stand and sing together.